Establishing your breast milk supply is one of the new mom's most important concerns. How often should I nurse? Is my baby getting enough? I feel like my baby is always on the breast. Today we are talking about tips and encouragement for the breastfeeding mom. I'm Rochelle Markham, internationally board certified lactation consultant, and this is Newbies. He's gorgeous. Um, it's a girl. Surprise! The whole family's here! So when are you having the next one? It's just poop. Ready for another? Wow, you look really tired. Ready to go back to work? Yellow poop, seriously? Did you sterilize this? Sex? Now? You've got to be joking. You should sleep when the baby sleeps. She doesn't look anything like you. I thought you already had your baby. I did. Babies don't come with instructions, so there's newbies, helping new moms and new babies through the first year. Welcome to Newbies, broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. Newbies is your online, on-the-go support group guiding new mothers through their baby's first year. I'm your host, Kristen Stratton. I'm also a certified birth doula, postpartum doula, and owner of Indu Season Doula Services. If you haven't already, be sure to visit our website at newmommymedia.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can also subscribe through iTunes so you'll automatically get new episodes when they're released. Sunny's here to tell us all about other ways you can participate in our new show. All right. Hi, everybody. And there are a couple different ways you can participate in the show. First is through social media. So Newbies has a Facebook page. We also have a Twitter account. So if you are on social media, please like us, follow us. We are going to be posting different questions that are relatable to new mamas and new babies um, on both of those platforms. So you can participate in the conversation that way. Also, if you want to be part of the Newbies podcast, Uh, We have a couple different segments that you can actually participate in right now. First is our Ask the Expert segment. So if you guys have questions, not just related to breastfeeding, but anything regarding being a new mama, any questions that you have, we have a whole list of experts on our site that are happy to answer your questions. So you can send us an email through the website, which is newmommymedia.com. We will read your question on the air on one of our shows, and that way everyone can benefit from the answer that the expert gives. And so that's one way you can do it. Also, we have a new segment that is our Mama Oops segment. It is a fun segment where um, new moms can submit all the funny stories that they've experienced, the the oops when you've got your newborn, the funny things that happen and um, that you're willing to admit at least. And so you can do the same thing. You can visit our website and submit through the website. We'll include all those stories on a future episode. Let's go ahead and meet our panelists. I'm Jennifer. I'm almost 31. I have two boys at home. One is four and the other one is now 13 months. I'm lucky enough to stay home with them. Uh, My name is Toriana Hamelsmith. I am 27. I'm a stay-at-home mom of two. My daughter is uh, three and a half and my son is four months. My name is Nicole and I'm an early childhood educator currently staying home with my boys who are two and a half and seven months. Um, While I'm staying home, I'm looking into going to school to be a certified lactation educator. Great. Well, thank you so much. Welcome to the show. So today on Newbies, we're going to be discussing a new headline that just was published today with the Tribune. Uh, The headline reads, Breastfeeding May Expose Babies to Toxic Chemicals. And it's talking about the uh, different chemicals that moms are exposed to and how some of that may wind up in uh, breast milk and therefore the babies are exposed to it. So we're really, really glad to have Rochelle here so she can kind of speak to this new report and kind of discuss its validity and what mom should know. I had a chance to look at it last night. Um, I think one of the things we need to always remember is that breast milk and breastfeeding is the biological norm for babies, regardless of things we may hear in the media, particularly, because things often get twisted a little bit and aren't always exactly what the science has said behind it. Um, I didn't actually get a chance to look at th- in detail at the science of this. A few things that I found interesting were that uh, the population they did this study on has a high Um, Their diet consists of a lot of seafood, and that's where a lot of these chemicals are coming from because that's their normal diet. They live on a small island up in the North Atlantic Ocean, and predominantly seafood is their main diet. So they are experiencing a lot higher intake of chemicals that are found in the ocean than probably we are in our normal diet. Our body does a pretty good job of giving baby exactly what baby needs when baby needs it, and that that's what we need to remember overall. 
Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. I mean, we should always be mindful of what we're putting into our bodies, regardless of whether or not we're breastfeeding. We just absolutely need to take good care of ourselves. But I don't think that we should, you know, run and clear the shelves of all the formula and immediately stop breastfeeding. I really don't think that that's the solution. No, definitely not. But yeah, absolutely watching what we expose ourselves to, what we expose our children to, and minimizing in ways we can minimize and where we can minimize. I think it's silly that they chose such a small population size and then said like, this is it. This is the study. Like, well, not everybody relies so heavily on uh, seafood on the mercury that's in deep sea fish or, or even just like regular seafood. Um, most people have a very diverse diet that can then counteract with the amount of maybe the uh, chemicals that they are getting, that they're then balancing it out with something else. Um, so the fact that, that they then read this study and then published it with such an, a headline like that, I feel is, is a little... Um, irresponsible of, of the, which, you know, isn't surprising, but um, <laughs> I just feel like it's a little irresponsible for them to say, especially since so many women work so hard to breastfeed and to continue. They, they have a lot of hurdles and struggles that um, they have to go through, and it's not easy. So, I mean, I feel like saying something so inflammatory like that is, is a little rude. <laughs> well, it can be really discouraging, too, yeah. to mothers that are thinking about breastfeeding and trying to weigh if it's going to be the right thing for them versus formula. And this could sway mothers that haven't had their babies yet yeah, to, oh, a well, to well, I'm going to be dangerous to my child, so formula will be so much better. And they because it's, you know, there's, it's balanced. And I mean, like, right. it's, it's good for what, just, I don't think that's a good headline. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Today on Newbies, we're discussing how to establish your breast milk supply as a new mom. Our expert is Rochelle Markham, an internationally board-certified lactation consultant. Welcome to the show. Thank you. What are some of the things a mom can do prenatally to prepare for a good breastfeeding relationship with her newborn? In my experience, what I find the most important is education. If a mom has educated herself on what life is like with a newborn, what to expect from a newborn, what to expect from breastfeeding, um, that is often the, the best way a mom can prepare prenatally is to know what life is going to look like with a newborn. Let's talk about when baby's here. What is the importance of skin to skin time with mom and baby for the breastfeeding relationship? Skin to skin time is awesome. Their uh, baby has been inside you for the last nine months. You've been holding baby, rocking baby, cuddling baby, and now baby's uh, been born. And baby really doesn't know what to doesn't know anything more than that. Baby wants to be on you, skin to skin, because that is baby's environment. Um, it helps baby's respirations normalize. It helps heart rate. It helps um, keep baby warm. The area between your breast actually heats up or cools down depending on what baby needs and responds accordingly to keep baby at exactly the right temperature, which then in turn helps stabilize blood sugars. So we've got a baby who is who is functioning at their best when they're skin to skin. And so not only then does baby... Uh, Is baby's heart rate good? Blood sugars are good. Temperature is good. Baby is then ready to feed much more frequently and and because baby's skin to skin, much more accessible. And baby wakes up and is ready to nurse more frequently that way. And I would imagine that would help mom notice baby's hunger cues more easily. Exactly. Baby's right there. Right there. Exactly. Hard to miss. (laughs) Yeah. Baby's wrapped up like a burrito in in the bassinet. It's often easy to miss some of those early feeding cues where baby's skin to skin, you don't miss those. And how often should a mom be breastfeeding her newborn to encourage her milk to come in? The bare minimum is eight times per 24 hours. Um, Ideally, it's 10 15, 20 times an hour. There are cultures where babies in the first few days typically nurse about 20 times a day. Very short feeds, but they're at breast nursing about 20 times a day. We In those cultures, they see far fewer um, tr- uh, issues with weight gain and far fewer issues with jaundice. So bare minimum is eight. A lot more is a lot better. And what is the average time frame for a woman's milk to come in? Typically, we see it around 72 hours, but there are a lot of variations with that. If mom has been nursing a baby through pregnancy, she'll often notice an increase in supply much sooner than that 72-hour mark. If mom has had a really long, hard labor, um, maybe a C-section or complications, then we often see a, a delay in that. 
And what can women do uh, once their milk has come in? And we all know that telltale rock hard boob engorgement phase. Um, what can they do to, you know, provide themselves with some comfort but still maintain their supply? Yes, that that can be a fun time frame, <laughs> an uncomfortable time frame. Just a little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that does actually help prevent engorgement, not entirely, but it can certainly help, is nursing at 10 plus times a day. Moms who have baby skin to skin and nursing real frequently in that first couple days often don't notice as dramatic engorgement. Um, so that's it's a that's a great way to start off well is nursing 10 plus times a day. Um, if you do get rock hard and experience the painful <laughs> engorgement period, um, there's a technique called um, reverse pressure softening that works really well at helping baby then latch because if, if your breast is so swollen that baby can't latch effectively, then you've got you create a whole nother series of problems and you can't uh, empty the breast and get comfortable. And so the reverse pressure sof softening really helps um, move the fluid that has accumulated in the breast that's not necessarily milk, but move the fluid away from the nipple and areola area and then allows baby to latch onto a softer breast and be able to drain the excess milk that you do have. Um, you can also use cold compresses. Warm showers can also help. Pumping typically makes the engorgement worse in the first little bit, so pumping is not going to be helpful like most, like many moms think it would be helpful. So that's it, that's something to avoid in the first couple days. And how about our panelists? I'm sure this is a very memorable time for you to remember those. Uh, looks like you got a boob job, but you didn't. <laughs> um, but probably hurts. It just hurts as just much. as much. Um, yeah. So why don't we open that up? Maybe Nicole can start us off with her experience. Um, with my first, he was premature, and I had a C-section. So it was probably five or six days before my milk fully came in, um, because he was in the NICU for a while. I was exclusively pumping and. In hindsight, I realized that I was too engorged for him to latch, which created um, nipple trauma, which then led to thrush and clogs and mastitis. I ex exclusively pumped for the first five months before we were finally able to latch, and that exclusive pumping created a massive oversupply for me. Um, and I didn't realize that until afterwards with the constant clogging and mastitis. And by the time we got everything cleared up, my supply had gone from an oversupply to no supply. So I was lucky to get five ounces every couple days when I pumped. Um, but I was able to, by six months, increase my supply, and we went on to nurse for a year and a half until I was halfway through my second pregnancy. That's amazing. That's great. Yeah. You're a breastfeeding warrior. <laughs> yes, yeah. definitely. That's amazing. <laughs> definitely <laughs> difficult. Something so natural shouldn't seem, you know, that it would be so difficult, and I don't, don't think a lot of people understand that, and I don't think a lot of women are educated enough to be able to push through it. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's a thing with breastfeeding, though. Like, people assume that it's just, you just pop the baby on and boom, you know, you're done. But it, there's, you know, there's pain, there's, and then there's engorgement, well, which even, is horrible. Even with <laughs> my second one, I figured, you know, I went through all of it with my first. This is me, Breeze. Yeah. And it wasn't until three months that we were actually able to because initially he had a great latch. He was a full-term baby, but I didn't notice, you know, later through the feeding, he was tucking his bottom lip in, which you know, yeah. created even more nipple trauma than my first had, and it took seven weeks for my nipples to fully heal. Oh. So we used a shield until three months when I was able to finally kick it, and, you know, I mean, three months isn't five or six months, but still. Yeah. I don't remember it really with my first either, but our nursing relationship was kind of sabotaged in the hospital. Um, I wasn't as educated with my first um, as I was with my second, and, um, but with with my second, um, I was engorged the day leaving the hospital, which was three days after my C-section. And um, so my milk came in ridiculously fast. Luckily with with him, I was much more educated and pretty much any, every, t every opportunity, I mean, I latched him and it really only lasted a couple of days. And I was very, very thankful for um, just that difference that a few years makes <laughs> in education. I mean, even though I was I wasn't very young, I just I just didn't know, and so it this time it wasn't horrible. It wasn't. I mean, it was very painful, and I have large breasts anyway, so it was so much worse. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but luckily, you know, I was able to stay home, and I had help, and so I could he would latch on, you know, 
all the time and it just it helped so much just to have him on the breast to to deal with with the engorgement yeah, babies are good at that. We, yeah, <laughs> if yes. you can get them latched. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for sharing so much. A lot of mothers worry about their baby not eating enough at night when they're sleeping, or uh, whether or not they should let their baby sleep at night through feedings. There's, you know, a lot of debate as to whether or not you should wake your baby up. So maybe you can speak to more about what mom should do. Um, I tend to follow the three rule that I three rules that I've kind of created is that baby has regained birth weight. Baby is showing that they're gaining well. Uh, you know, we're, we're not dealing with a, a baby who's struggling to gain weight. So baby's regained birth weight, gaining well, um, has the right number of peas and poops every 24 hours so that we are not worried about intake, and mom is comfortable. If mom is comfortable, nipples and breasts are comfort- comfortable, and all three of those things have been met, then you do not let you do not wake up that baby. Let baby tell you when baby's ready to eat. If you're struggling with weight gain, if we're, um, if you're very painful, either from engorgement or from really sore nipples, then we wake baby up to nurse more frequently and evaluate what's causing those problems. And what about a mom who's maybe uh, been told that she, her baby has a high bilirubin count, you know, jaundice, um, but baby's really sleepy. But. Yeah, those are hard babies to, to wake up to feed because the bilirubin makes them so sleepy. But getting more calories in them is the fix for that, which means we don't let them sleep, unfortunately. Once you get past that, then you can let them sleep. Um, but keeping them well fed meaning that we're waking them to feed at least every two hours in the beginning is important. If a mom in a previous breastfeeding relationship didn't have enough milk or felt that she didn't um, and was worried that if she let her baby sleep, that that would that that will her. affect supply. Yeah. So what would your advice be? Once we've met those three things, with the three rules, meaning baby's gaining well, mom's comfortable, peas and poops are okay, then really letting baby dictate exactly how much baby needs. Typically, takes care of all problems. And milk supply is not usually a problem when you're letting baby, because babies innately know exactly what they need and they're good at that. They're good at telling us exactly what they need. And so by following those cues, we don't typically see some milk supply problems. If we do have a past history, then we watch a little bit closer and mom can keep track a little bit closer to make sure that she's producing enough. Wonderful. Thank you so much. When we come back, we will continue our discussion about establishing milk supply for new moms. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. We're talking with Rochelle Markham, IBCLC, about how to establish your breast milk supply. Rochelle, when a mother is returning to work at six weeks postpartum, uh, when should she begin to pump and how can this affect her milk supply? I usually like to encourage moms to wait until they've passed the two to three uh, week uh, growth spurt. That two to week, two to three week growth spurt can be quite trying and to add pumping in on top of that can really be exhausting. So once baby has passed the two week growth spurt, sometimes happens around three weeks, then mom can start pumping either after feeds and combine the milk she's pumped during the day to store. Um, She can add in a special pumping time during baby if baby has a longer sleep stretch pump in the middle of that sleep stretch um there are lots of different ways that mom can get in a pumping session to store some milk for returning to work although you don't need a whole lot a lot of moms love to have hundreds of ounces in their freezer and that's not always something you need if because you'll be pumping at work to to feed the milk or to pumping at work to get the milk baby needs for the following day. So you really don't need a huge stockpile in your freezer. So you don't need to spend your entire six weeks at home with baby pumping. Spend that time with baby. And for moms who maybe have to pump exclusively from day one, what's the best way to ensure they meet their baby's needs? Lots of skin to skin. Baby helps trigger milk supply that way by lots of skin to skin and frequent pumping just as if you were nursing baby at breast. And any mom who needs to use syringe feeding or a supplemental nursing system, uh, what's helpful to facilitate bonding while that milk supply gets established? Those are some great tools, but they're also some stressful tools. So having help at home definitely helps with those tools because really you need an extra set of hands. Um, So it does help keep baby at breast, which is a great thing, which helps stimulate milk supply and bonding. 
and they are great tools to use, but they can also be a little stressful. And so having an extra pair of hands in that, even if that means you have to ask someone to come help you, that's a, those are great ways to help with an SNS. And how would a mom know her baby is receiving enough milk? You mentioned weight gain, but what about output? How do we know if baby is getting enough in? That, that's easy. If nothing goes in, nothing comes out. If plenty goes in, plenty comes out. So all we have to do is watch the peas and poops. They will tell us exactly whether or not baby's getting enough. Six wet diapers or more per 24 hours and, in, and three or more poopy diapers in the beginning, and you know baby's getting plenty. So if you're ever concerned, just watch those diapers and they'll tell you exactly what baby's getting. And maybe some of our panelists can share that uh, progression of poops and peas throughout that first week. That's always a fun experience. With my first, like I like I had mentioned before, I was concerned about whether or not he was getting enough because he was my first. I didn't really know. Um, and, you know, one of the nurses was like, well, if you're concerned, just give him formula. You know, she didn't mention... <laughs> you know, she didn't mention, you know, oh, well, how, and, and they did, they had me keep a log of, of how many wet, how many poopy diapers throughout the day, but not mentioning any correlation between, between breastfeeding or, you know, his consumption versus what was coming out. And, um, but one thing we, I did know was that his first few days of poop was that very, that meconium, that very black, sticky mess. <laughs> and, um, the nurse that was, she was actually quite r- rude, unfortunately. Um, she had come in to just change his diaper, apparently, because she felt she needed to. And she had taken his diaper off, and right then he poops, and it's this big black bubble, and it's still sticking to him. And I I tried to laugh because her hand was right there. And I tried not to laugh because I thought it was just the funniest thing. It's like, my kid doesn't like you so much. He just about <laughs> pooped on you. <laughs> Um, but you know, then getting home and, and and everything and it, and it turns this kind of soupy, mustardy, yellow, weird with specks in it. And it's a very, it's a kind of a slow change, but it's, it's really interesting (laughs) to, to see that from that very black, very sticky to much less solid. (laughs) Yes, th- that normal transition from the meconium to the green to the yellow is is um it, it also tells us that baby's getting enough. Yeah. Because if we're still seeing meconium on day five, six, seven, we know baby's not getting enough. So, uh, you you will as, as a new mom, you will probably spend more time discussing poop and thinking about poop than you ever thought you would. <laughs> With my first, he would go probably several times a feeding. Um, and that was every feeding for the day. So that might be, you know, 10 feedings a day, three bowel movements per feeding. And then probably at about four months, he's finally slowed down to four bowel movements a day, which he held consistent until now at two and a half. Um, and my second was completely opposite. He would just go a couple times a day, and now he'll go three or four days without one and then have a whole day of nothing but bowel movements. <laughs> Um, And I think a lot of moms start to get concerned when their digestive system changes and they go from having 18 poops a day to maybe one or waiting four days in between. But that's, you know, again, back to the education factor where you have to kind of research and look into that so you don't have to stress yourself out in those early days because there's already a lot of things you have to focus on. I guess we we know the weight gain is going up and that's reassuring at that point too. Absolutely. And uh, when should a mother contact an IBCLC? If you are having sore nipples and soreness past, I've never done this before, I'm uncomfortable. If it's past that where you are dreading feeding, you are your toes are curling at the thought of having to latch baby, definitely call a, a lactation consultant. Um, if baby's not getting enough peas and poops at, in 24 hours or, and is super sleepy and you're having a really hard time waking baby, call a lactation consultant. Um, Really, if you have any concerns about feeding a baby, pick up the phone and give us a call. We'll be happy to answer those questions because mo- a lot of times we can answer those questions over the phone and give you the information you need. And if not, then you can go in and see a lactation consultant who can help you, uh, you know, one-on-one get baby latching well or evaluate their suck. Um, 
there, you know, there's lots of things we can do to make mom comfortable and make sure that she's she's comfortable and make sure baby's getting what baby needs. And I know sometimes you can do a weighed feeding to see how yes. much milk is actually transferring. Yeah. For moms who are still a little nervous about how much baby's doing, we can do a pre and post weight feed where we weigh baby before nursing, let baby nurse, weigh baby afterwards. It gives us a, a good clue as to how well baby's feeding. It's not the only tool to use because it's not a hundred percent accurate but it definitely can reassure a mom who thinks maybe she's not making enough milk and then baby gained five ounces in the last 15 minutes (laughs) so it's it that is a good tool that's a good confidence builder right there yes exactly (laughs) thank you so much rochelle and our lovely panelists for chatting with us today about breastfeeding tips for the new mom oh and keep in mind that we do have the boob group which is a separate podcast it's all about breastfeeding and we have like 125 plus episodes that are just geared towards breastfeeding. So if you guys are listening to this and go, I need more breastfeeding information, head on over to newmommymedia.com and you can listen to the episodes there. And for our Newbies Club members, our conversation will continue after the end of this show as Rochelle will share her favorite resources for breastfeeding when your baby is in the NICU. For more information about the Newbies Club, please visit our website at newmommymedia.com. Hi, this is Jennifer. I'm from San Diego, California. I have a six-month-old daughter, and she is breastfed right now, but my pediatrician keeps wondering about uh, whether or not I need to give her iron supplements. Um, So my questions for you are, what are the signs that a baby is iron deficient, and is it difficult to test for iron deficiency? And I'd really love to stay away from unnecessary unnecessary supplements, so your advice would be uh, greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Johnson. Luckily, Jennifer, we really don't need those any longer. They're in our infant food, our formula, mom's prenatal vitamins. We do normally, at least in our office, check at nine months of age to see if a child is anemic. The rather simple test involves a finger stick, and you can instantly know what their blood count is. And most of the time, I would say maybe once or twice a year now, I feel the need to use iron. So it's uh, sort of a thing of the past, but we still check for it anyway. As far as other supplements, probably number one right now on the list is vitamin D for breastfeeding infants. Uh, Breastfeeding infants are felt not to get enough vitamin D, so we usually supplement that. Vitamin D is a substance that helps us build strong bones and has really become more prominent as far as a nutritional need. So I hope that answers your question. Have a good day. Thank you. That wraps up our show for today. We appreciate you listening to Newbies. Don't forget to check out our sister show, Preggy Pals, for expecting parents. Parent Savers for Moms and Dads with Infants and Toddlers, The Boob Group for Moms Who Breastfeed, and Twin Talks for Parents of Multiples. Thanks for listening to Newbies, your go-to source for new moms and new babies. This has been a New Mommy Media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care, and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. New Mommy Media is expanding our lineup of shows for new and expecting parents. If you have an idea for a new series, or if you're a business or organization interested in joining our network of shows through a co-branded podcast, visit newmommymedia.com. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.